thank you for listening <laughs> and interrupting your dinner so that I can give the dinner talk. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's really great to be here because uh, you're such an amazing group. I looked at your pictures and read about your interests, soccer and everything else. Uh, uh, I uh, have a history in this field. Uh, I was here as a grad student intern here being Argonne National Lab uh, 45 years ago. And uh, a lot's changed since then. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the story of that that whole arc from the pre-supercomputing era to today. Uh, and the theme is that while we've come a long way, I'll tell you how many orders of magnitude, more or less, of performance, um, and explain why and how we got to where we are today, that there's still a long way to go. So um, you presumably figured this out, that's why you're in the field, but uh, I have to tell you, you've made a terrific choice. So uh, in order to predict the future, which is what I'm talking about here, you have to know something about the past. Somebody said that somewhere. There's a, you know, quotations on the walls here. One of them is from Abraham Lincoln, but of course he didn't actually say it. Right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so let's talk a little about the past of computing. And it's a quiz. Uh, please, this is audience participation. Take a guess. What is this? Yes, back in the room. Yeah. It's, it's Greek. It's Greek. Yeah. You know where they found it? At the bottom of the Mediterranean, yeah. <laughs> so this is called the Antikythera mechanism. Antikythera is a little Greek island near Kythera. Go figure. Uh, and it's an analog device for computing the motions the, through the sky. Nobody knew what the motions through three space was, but through, through the sky of the planets. They know that the planets are involved because the Greek letters that spell out Aphrodite, Venus, can be made out on the, uh, the thing. <clears throat> That's pretty old. I guess 300 BC, something like that. This one is a, yeah, what is it? It's an abacus from having a guess where. There's like CCC, uh, one of those. It has nothing to do with the Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, this, it's a Roman abacus made of bronze. So, you know, between 1 and 400 AD, I guess. Now we're getting into digital logic. The abacus is kind of a something digital analog. Can you see centaines de mille, dizaines de mille, mille, etc.? OK. Anyone? Go well. Sorry? It's what? Uh, yes. Yes, it's Pascal. It's a, that's right. So there was a whole industry of making these things beginning in 16-something. Yeah, so this is a you know, digital calculator, mechanical digital calculator, invented by Pascal in his 20s. Uh, I couldn't get rid of the uh, caption. <laughs> Babbage, England, end of the 19th century. So here we have the, the first thousand years of computers. We started out with gears, and after a thousand years, we had better gears. It was still muscle-powered. Uh, if you go to the Computer History Museum website, they have a timeline, and they think computing began in 1933, but what do they know? This is the first thing. Uh, and uh, this is, anybody ever use one of those? Uh, OK, you remember in old movies and TV shows, whenever they showed like anything involving technology, you could hear the sound of the machines going ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. Yeah, that's these. So this is 
te these are teletype machines. This is like the first digital whatever communication other than radio, which you know is analog. All right, and then a very brief moment, you know, relative to thousand be uh, two thousand years. A moment later, we have gone from the teletype to this. So here's uh, today's world champion summit, Oak Ridge, 2.4 million cores, according to the top 500 website. I just want to point out one thing about these, these early machines. Here are their inventors. Uh, Pascal up there, Babbage, Ada, who was the first programmer who worked for Babbage, Ada Lovelace and um, the Greek statue known as the Antikythera Youth. I don't know if he made the mechanism. The others, we're pretty sure about. And what they all have in common is that they're the same age as most of you, in their 20s, 30s. They're the pioneers. So let's get, uh, you know, Babbage only gets us to the end of the mechanical sequential computing era. Let's go beyond and start talking about computing and how we got to where we are, uh, the parallel computing era. And uh, you know the arc of the story, it, unfortunately, there are six acts. Shakespeare only had five. Uh, but I have to talk about the six acts, the controversy about parallel computing, the success of parallel computing, the technological basis for the success of parallel computing, the crisis we're in now, why we need to, to push beyond this crisis and continue to advance the state of the art in parallel computing, uh, and a look ahead to how I think we're going to do that. I have complete faith in our ability to continue pushing ahead in advancing the power of computers. Uh, why am I so involved in this? Well, you know, I used to do computational science, and I wrote papers about solving PDEs on supercomputers, and then I started writing about uh, parallel algorithms and then parallel software, and then I started working for computer companies, and they said, cut that out and help us build more computers. So I've been, for 20 years, thinking about how to build better computers. <clears throat> in the beginning, parallel computers were controversial. Who is this guy, and why is he famous? Amdahl, anyone remember his first name? Gene, Gene Amdahl. He was an IBM executive, and he spun out his own company to build clones of IBM, you know, num uh, machines that were commonly used in business. And somebody suggested that maybe we should start thinking about doing things in parallel, and I, Amdahl pointed out that if the fraction of the work, you know Amdahl's law. If you can do one, uh, f is the fraction parallel, and the biggest speed up you can get is one over f. If you can do two thirds, f is the fraction you can't do in parallel. What did I say? I got this wrong, huh? <laughs> if the sequential fraction is f, the maximum speed up is one over f. That was a test. I hope you noticed my error. Um, well, you know, people kept hitting us over the head with damned Amdahl's law every time we talked about parallel computing for like the first 10 years of parallel computing. Um, anybody tell me what's the matter with Amdahl's law? How come it's, well, you can prove, this is not a, this is not a law like, like Gresham's law or Moore's law because it doesn't tell you anything you couldn't prove with high school algebra, right? It's a, it's a trivial lemma. But yeah. In other words, you agree with me that given epsilon greater than zero, there exists somebody smart enough to make the Amdahl fraction less than epsilon. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be talking about 2.4 million cores if that wasn't true, clearly. <clears throat> uh, there was this notion about speed up. Speed up was the time on one processor divided by the time on P processors. Uh, and efficiency 
the efficiency with P processors is the speed up you get with P processors divided by P. And who are these two characters? These are people who are maybe less well known to you. So the guy on the right is Gordon Bell. Some of you may win his award or have done. Uh, he actually was preceded by Alan Karp in the upper left to work for IBM, helping IBM customers do things in parallel in the early days. And he was having such a hell of a bad time of it that he said, I'll give $100 to anybody who can show a 100x speed up, really, for real, without cheating, on a real problem. And then Gordon Bell, uh, who had worked on some of the earliest parallel machines, C.MMP at Carnegie, said, um, uh, that's a great idea, and 100 isn't enough. So he <laughs> kicked in <laughs> some of his actual real wealth, and it became, I guess, 10,000. Why do we not, you know, why, why is efficiency the wrong thing to think about defined thus? I mean, do we get 2.4 million x speed up on the 2.4 million core summit? And do we even bother with that question? I, efficiency might, you know, talk about work produced per dollar. If I have to buy a petaflop worth of memory in order to hold the problem, why would I spend only $100 on one processor? So really, they should, you know, efficiency and productivity are really all about work per unit cost. And cost involves people time, time cost of waiting to get the answer, all the other costs. When you look at those costs, it turns out parallel computing is really, really, really efficient. It pays for itself. I know it pays for itself because you might think you're not an important part of the computer industry, but that's not true. Uh, the total server market is $100 billion a year, of which about 15% is high-performance computing. So it's, it's important to science, also important to the computer companies. Uh, well, MapReduce uh, got a lot of press to, and a lot of interest. MapReduce was a paradigm for using clusters that Google proposed and pushed, oh, what, 10, 15 years ago? Anybody remember MapReduce? Matrix vector product is a form of MapReduce. Um, and they did MapReduce by, if it was matrix vector product, they did it by distributing the matrix to the processors by rows. Each processor got a subset of the rows, or equivalently, the columns. Neither of them works very well. <laughs> uh, and when you, but it's perfectly parallel. You get, 100% of the workload is done in parallel, and the load balance is perfectly you know, equal. Nothing could possibly go wrong, right? Well, here's the speed ups you got as a function of number of processors, and it's pretty disappointing. Uh, you're hitting a wall. Anybody know why matrix vector product distributed by rows doesn't work? You divided up the work, but what costs time on big parallel machines? The computation, the, the work, the number crunching? Yeah, you, you know too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Moving the data, communication, is what matters. MapReduce, or this, this approach to distributing work doesn't, doesn't work. So when you do a matrix vector product, you distribute the matrix by blocks on a two-dimensional array of processors. If you do computation on a graph in which the nodes communicate constantly, don't distribute the nodes, the vertices. That's the same as distributing the rows. You distribute the edges. Uh, that works. So that was a mistake. It's the memory in the network, not the, and, you, and the algorithm. Uh, last thing that we had to labor through was this whole period of protecting our investment in crummy old Fortran code on punched cards. We came along with parallel computers, and of course, those Fortran programs weren't going to run on more than one processor. 
So imagine you tell the customer, hey, here's a computer a billion times more powerful than the one you have. Yeah, but will I have to rewrite my code? <laughs> you heard that all the time. So there was a lot of interest in automatic parallelization. Can we get the compiler to do it? After all, the program just says what I want done. It sort of tells the computer how to do it, but I want you to forget that it says the, tells the computer how to do it and just figure out from the program what I want done and then figure out what I really want done and then figure out the better algorithm for what I want done and do that all automatically. Of course, that was a complete and utter failure and we had to rewrite everything. And you know, those old Fortran codes sit around gathering dust. So let me introduce you to one more interesting personality, the first winner of the Turing Award. Uh, and the uh, guy who did a great deal for me when I was a student, Alan Perlis. Uh, he was uh, one of the people who created the CMU CS department and then the ALCS department. And he's famous for pithy observations about computing that Yale CS has on the web. Uh, you, if you Google Alan Perlis, cool things he said, you'll find his thing. But that first one it completely captures the whole evolution of parallel computing. Uh, you know, the computer people keep pushing on and doing what they find possible based on the hardware realities. And if they try and accommodate the machine to the old algorithms, they go nowhere. So we have to figure out how to optimize for the new machine. But then don't get too wedded to, to your program and its optimizations because the machines are going to evolve and you might have to put that code aside as another dusty deck and, and move on. So anyway, despite all of the bad ideas uh, and uh, people scolding us about Amdahl's law, we, we pushed on. And today we have uh, spectacularly fast machines and almost all of the performance is due to parallelism. So from 1975 to today, we went from peak speed of the Cray-1, 100 megaflops, uh, to 100, what's that, 10 to the 17th? So yeah, we're within a factor of 10 of the exaflop. So uh, nine orders of magnitude, one from clock rate. <laughs> the clock rate on the Cray-1 was 80 megahertz. So maybe it's two orders of magnitude. Uh, no, it's 0.1, okay, it's one to two orders of magnitude from clock rate. Almost all of it's from parallelism. The Cray-1 had one processor. It had a vector capability, but it still did one floating point operation per clock. Uh, yeah, we're putting in 100 times more power than we had to, electric power, and the machine costs 10 times as much. Well, that's not a bad return on investment, you know. Nine orders of magnitude for 10x more money. Uh, and here's how it goes. You've probably seen this graph. So well, it's the top 500 graph. Extrapolated back to the era of uh, Babbage. <laughs> no, no, no. Beyond Babbage. They replaced the hand crank with electric motors. So those were desk calculator type machines. Uh, in that leftmost era. And this is a log linear plot. So a straight line is exponential growth. And you see there are four distinct eras, roughly. Uh, so the computer gets invented in the late 40s, and that's the era I call ENIAC, based on the vacuum tube. There were no transistors. Shockley and Bardeen, 53, I think is the transistor. Uh, then you have transistor-based sequential computers. They became vector computers, but basically they were single processor. That's the red line. Then you get the parallel era powered by VLSI, the integrated circuit and Moore's law. 
Notice the slope is greater there, so that's the Moore's law doubling. But what really striking is it was always exponential. It just, the lambda has changed. But we, we had exponential growth in the pre-Moore's law era. Something else was happening, you know, there, but there was technological improvement, sort of a compound interest of technological improvement. Okay, uh, so that was great. Uh, now, how about predicting the future? Uh, that was a look back. So when I was uh, postdoc, 77, uh, boy, there's a lot, a lot happened between 74 and my Argonne summer in 77. I, I went to Caltech and S Ivan Sutherland, who was a real pioneer of computing, gave, had become a full professor there and gave a public lecture, the whole Caltech community and whoever else wanted to hear him came. The title was The VLSI Revolution is Only Half Over. Sutherland is known for basically inventing computer graphics. He's a student of Claude Shannon, an amazing character. And the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, he didn't really get that right. So uh, he was right that it wasn't over. So here's Ivan in that uh, story of exponentials. And you see, we were still in that sequential vector era in terms of supercomputing. So why was he talking about VLSI? Well, it turns out we weren't building supercomputers out of VLSI chips yet. And we didn't start until around 1991, which is when that green thing took off. But if you see you know, the orders of magnitude here, uh, m way more of the growth came after the Sutherland talk than before. So it had much more than halfway to go. So technology triumphed. So what happened after Ivan? So let's talk a little about the technology that we used to build supercomputers. So here's the first supercomputer. It's the first supercomputer because it was the first computer that somebody called a supercomputer. That was the only thing that changed. The, the name was coined by the, by the press, I guess. Uh, and uh, it's the Cray one. Uh, that's Seymour, uh, Seymour Cray. Uh, the company was uh, based in Minneapolis. Uh, it was completely non-standard, non-VLSI, non-integrated circuit technology. Uh, they, they built the hardware on PC boards out of resistors and uh, you ever see a transistor package that's one transistor? You know, they had like three legs. They looked like the Martian fighting machines from War of the Worlds, just small. That's what was in there. And wires measured exactly so that the signal delay would be controlled to within, you know, a nano, less than a nanosecond. Totally custom. Worked for only for HPC. A little earlier, Intel made the first microprocessor in 1971. This is the Intel 4004. So it's kind of the birth of Silicon Valley and the microprocessor. Ridiculously slow, useless for scientific computing. A uh, little time goes by, and I don't know if you've ever seen this famous New Yorker magazine cover from 1976 showing the world as seen by people from my hometown. Uh, so uh, time goes by, and, and at Argonne, Argonne gets into parallel computing. We, we, we go parallel. Uh, Argonne is already a center. So this is from the 80s, and it's the world of parallel processing. I don't know who the cartoonist is, but that's the Argonne. Don't know what, C, don't know what CRF. A stood for Argonne. <laughs> Advanced computing research something. I don't know. Uh, and the point I want to make here is not that there is a cute cartoon, but you see all the companies, Amatech, Ardent, Saxby, that was, I was the CTO, Sidrome, uh, FPS, Sequent, these are all parallel computer companies. Today we have like two, IBM and Cray, right? Oh, NVIDIA. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're all over the place. Terra, Terra was still in, Maryland before, because it was made at Argonne. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, a bunch around Boston. So this was an interesting era, the 80s. It was before 1990, before the VLSI took off. So this was an era of experimental parallel machines. The top one supercomputer throughout this era was probably still a big Cray vector machine. But we were using VLSI to play around with parallel computing and explore what it was going to be. And no one knew what to do. So there were SIMD machines and MIMD machines. Thinking Machine CM2 was a SIMD machine. Uh, there were shared memory and distributed memory. Uh, and endless debates about what was going to be the better thing to use. Uh, I can tell you about that debate, but maybe if you come to the bar with me later. There was a company that had only cache that was called COMA, Cache Only Memory Architecture. Uh, there were hypercube connected machines, and everybody thought the hypercube was a great idea until we figured out it wasn't. Uh, transputers, that was a very interesting thing that had lightweight messaging and was English. There was uh, dialects of message passing. Uh, we, Smith and the Terra, that was all about could you run fast even though memory accesses took forever. Uh, and we were working on these things at all levels of price from from the, the single user workstation up to the supercomputer. So it was crazy. It was the confused 80s. So that was the era of custom, specialized. Still, you know, a lot of people were designing their own chip specifically for one parallel machine. Uh, but then microprocessors caught up. So there was a, a Watershed moment was the supercomputing conference in 91 when a guy named Eugene Brooks, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the transit, what happened to the micro? So the, the 4004, too slow, only had 2,000 transistors. Uh, Moore's law doubled nine times in, in 18 years, 19 years, and you went 512x to a million transistors, and now this is getting fast enough to be cost competitive, performance per unit, whatever, competitive with the vector supercomputers. And then they just kept on going. So Eugene Brooks at Supercomputing gives a, a great panel talk, no one will ever forget, in which he ended by saying, no one will survive the attack of the killer micro, influenced by Hollywood's worst movie of the era. <laughs> uh, and uh, Markov, New York Times science writer, says, Cray is worried by killer micros, which are going to cost $100,000. Well, that's a little bit off from what a PC costs today. Well, we, this was an era when people were still trying to make big, expensive scientific PCs and call them workstations. So after 90, then the attack really happens. The mass market for servers, PCs, and so on drove investment in VLSI fabs. So Intel just keeps doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling the density and the performance and the clock rate increases. There was this thing called Denard scaling, which was a basic physics applied to the transistor that said you could squeeze more and more transistors, they got faster, and they, didn't, they consumed less energy so that even though you were putting more and more on the chip, the total power of the chip was the same. Uh, and these things got cheap because they were commodities. So by 2000, in that 10 years from 90 to 2000, all HPC machines became clusters of off-the-shelf, you know, not specialized, one-size-fits-all. Uh, processors. And we made a big contribution. We put all of the debates to rest, pretty much, and s discovered that shared memory hard, distributed memory not as hard, uh, programming language, whatever you want, plus MPI. 
basically meant Fortran or C plus MPI. So we had this portable dialect. We all understood it. It was close to what the machine was doing. You got performance. It was even almost portable performance. So that was a golden age of homogeneous world of the same cluster containing the same node, and that node only had one kind of processor. Uh, we gained seven orders of magnitude from 90 to 2010, riding this wave uh, before GPUs. That seven orders of magnitude exceeds the gains from 1942 to the pre-electronic era to 1990. It's really quite remarkable, but that's an exponential with a greater lambda that lasts for an enormously long time. Uh, and we lost all diversity. All computers were the same. And all supercomputers were just a bunch of those identical computers hooked together by, well, in the end, uh, what, InfiniBand. Now the crisis. Denard's scaling ended. Uh, Denard's scaling ended because of leaky transistors. You couldn't reduce the voltage as you increased the clock rate. And because you couldn't increase the voltage, the power dissipation of the transistors was fixed. So the more you put on the chip, the more power you needed. And it became impossible to cool the chip. So the clock rate stopped dropping. Clock rate has just hit a wall. I mean, what do we got for clocks today? Three gigahertz, right? Well, we've had that for 10 years. Uh, but we kept putting more transistors onto the chip, and we got more parallelism, and we introduced GPUs, and they have a lot more parallelism. So we've gotten further gains strictly through parallelism, not through clock. And will that last forever? Some people say Moore's law will never end. Well, you're not going to be able to read this anywhere, but I know that Moore said that Moore's law will end, because I was there. <laughs> he was on a stage being interviewed by Carver Mead, uh, who wrote this famous book with, with Lynn Conway that introduced VLSI to the whole electrical engineering, to all the students of electrical engineering of the late 70s and 80s. And Moore said, when asked if Moore's law is going to end, there's no getting around this problem. So Moore's law is ending. We're building chips now at seven nanometer dimensions. Five nanometer is planned. It's on the horizon. Maybe there'll be a three. But no one expects it to go much farther than that. The costs of building the fabs is growing exponentially. And the benefits don't, may not, that'll, Moore's law will end not because of physical limits, but because of economic limits. So we, we need to get to a post-Moore era. And there's a pressing need to do this. Well, even without my pressing need, you guys know that we can do a lot more still. I mean, it would be great if we could prove things about physics and biology, chemistry, climate, and many other things by incredibly uh, accurate and uh, uncertainty quantified calculation. And that would take a lot more capability than we have today. But in addition, now there's a new ringer. And that's AI, which is becoming clear that it's going to have a big impact on science along with everything else. And the compute demand for training deep neural networks is growing at faster than the Moore's law rate. And there's no sign of it slowing down. Uh, so 300,000x, this is according to the people at OpenAI, which is a startup of some of the leading people in neural networks. And it can take weeks to train uh, an ambitious neural network. Training is a bottleneck in the development of AI. So we, we want to do training. Now, the, you know, the, you've seen papers, I think, about uh, training ResNet on a full DOE supercomputer. And you can do it. But uh, that's a pretty big, expensive resource for training a neural network. So. Uh, 
to get beyond Moore's law and to deal with this, we, we're going to have to stop using one size fits all, and we already have. So we've gotten to the era of the heterogeneous node, the GPU and the CPU. And it's paid a big dividend. You can see the this rough comparison of the state of CPUs and GPUs today. Same chip, same size, same silicon, same transistors, same number of transistors, pretty much. The difference is the architecture. The GPU doesn't have to run the operating system. It doesn't have to run Microsoft Word in the compiler. It throws overboard all that baggage and says, let's just do arithmetic fast. And you get a 10x improvement. Big deal. It's a, bi it's a big improvement. Same power, roughly. Um, but first, so we went through this era of the GP GPU, and it got us that 10x. But the GPU wasn't designed to be a general purpose machine. It wasn't designed for AI. It was designed for graphics. So it raises the question whether if we throw the graphics overboard, we can go beyond that. And that's already happened to. So we have AI-optimized accelerators today. Uh, Volta, uh, a new GPU from NVIDIA, has uh, something they call tensor cores, TPU from Google, the tensor processing unit, the graph core chip. They're also chips of about the same size and the same transistor budget and the same power. Another factor of 10 by specializing. These aren't GP. These are general purpose. They're, they're AI optimized chips. And the, of course, you know about Desres, the Shaw Research, and their attempt to do a specialized machine, which was technically quite successful. So we can recover some of the, the momentum that, we, that we're losing due to Moore's Law uh, by specialization. But still not enough for AI. So it takes days to train ResNet 50. This is a, an image classification, state of the art, image classification deep neural network uh, on the Volta, the most advanced GPU. You know, if it's like when I started writing code to, to you know, play poker in Cornell University programming language when I was 20 years old, and you would hand a deck of cards to the guy at the window at the computer center, and hours or, or a day later, you'd come back and get your printout. That's where they are in training neural networks. Uh, so what we need to have, and what I think we're about to get, is a new era, a post-Moore era. I think the exponential growth rate won't be as good as it was during the VLSI era. But I have confidence that, that we will continue to see an exponential growth, because we always have before. Uh, we haven't run out of ideas, and we haven't run out of things to try. Um, there was no exponential, clearly, in that Antikythera up to Babbage. <laughs> I think that wasn't an exponential growth. <clears throat> so we're going to scale everything else. We're not going to scale the transistor size as much. Here's just a list of some things that I'm aware of today that, that we're going to try. They won't all work, but they all have promise. Specialization, I've mentioned. Uh, the top 500 list that may have clusters of different kinds intended for different things. So we could have a heterogeneous world of, heter of you know, some it's a homogeneous cluster of heterogeneous nodes. We may have heterogeneous clusters of homogeneous and heterogeneous nodes. Uh, better algorithms. A lot of the advances we've made over that time have been by using the old, uh, you know, the, the brain. AI, putting AI to work. Uh, there's a lot of interest in memory technologies. DRAM also is looking at limits and its ability to, to, to get denser, and it's already way too slow. Uh, photonic connection as opposed to electronic connection. That same Carver Mead, who was a guru of uh, electronics, 
wrote a paper in 1990 and said, you know, it's really, really stupid to send a signal from here to there by pumping charge into a wire here, fully charging the capacitance of that wire until the voltage rises. Well, photonics is an answer to that problem. Not the only, but it's an answer. Uh, two and a half D, three D. People are talking about stacking chips, stacking wafers, growing chips in the third dimension without necessarily you know, in one, one shot, or interposer technology that allows you to put chips and wafers side by side with much better connectivity than we have now. Uh, wafer scale, don't, you know, all chips are made by taking a 12 inch disc of silicon, using photolithography to expose a chip which is small, and then stepping that across the wafer, then slicing them up. You're about to hear about a technology that doesn't slice them up, but can interconnects them and uses the whole wafer. Uh, quantum, it's real. You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And other two st stuff that I don't know about, and it's too weird to mention yet, but there will be other ideas. So chip scaling. Well, now I'm going to get around to what I'm up to uh, at Cerebrus. So uh, in May, EE Times let our cat out of the bag because we've been in stealth mode. The company's about three years old. I'm not a founder. I was like the 50th or 60th employee. Uh, but they say at the Hot Chips conference in August this year, Several companies will talk about their deep learning processors, and Cerebrus will describe uh, a much anticipated device using wafer scale integration. And uh, they told the truth. So we're building a wafer scale system for deep learning. I can't tell you speeds, feeds, and statistics and steal the boss's thunder. He'd be upset. Uh, but it's a Distributed, see, we learned something from you guys. It's distributed memory. It's fine-grained. Uh, it's all identical processors. They are reasonably fast. There is a ridiculously large number of them on the wafer. They're very well interconnected. Uh, so, and they have memory locally. So you have extremely high memory bandwidth, extremely low memory latency, extremely high interprocessor interconnect bandwidth, extremely low interconnect latency, and a lot of performance. Uh, the, it's just an array of these, you know, triples. The, the, the router, the compute, and the memory, and then identical across the wafer. And um, we're 50, more than 50x bigger in real estate than competing chips, and we'll tell you, you know, later about the teraflops and the transistors, but we're 50x bigger. And, and we're doing what they're doing with that real estate, just more of it. You know, if you can't put more transistors per square millimeter, put more square millimeters on the chip. Uh, so uh, that's the entire contents of our website, because we're in stealth mode. And notice the help wanted in the, on the right at the bottom. Uh, we have internships, and we hire people fresh out of school. OK, thanks very much for listening.